Anyway, so today we're doing uh, sketching outside. I've got this little handout which I sent you and we're going to concentrate on people because obviously they're the hardest thing to do and we did architecture last week and nature yeah we'll see if we can fit it in particularly the nice picture of the old codgers having champagne at Glyndebourne I thought that was quite good so we're going to start with uh, just uh, um, showing the new people and uh, you lot about the proportion of the human body um, so I have my mad handout. I wonder what I'm with it. Uh, <clears throat> so I've got this handout here, which if you want, I could send that to you. Um, it's just out of this wonderfully old-fashioned book where everybody looks like uh, Rita Hayworth. Well, obviously he doesn't, but out of Mad Men. Just to show you, just to uh, make you remember that the halfway point of the human body is generally the hip, point, hip bone. On this point, uh, in this book, they've said the crutch. Um, and here, what they've done with the lady, they like to make her legs longer so she looks more glamorous. But it's halfway to the hip point, uh, to the hip bone. So that's a good start. Um, so I'm just going to go through that. You can draw along with me if you like. Um, so I've got a felt tip. Ooh, wrong end. Let's try this one. So if we start at the top and at the bottom, and then we think about the halfway point, and then we uh, probably put a head in. So if we have a head, I'll probably give it a neck, uh, shoulders, let's make it a lady. Oops, is that the halfway? It seems a bit long. Like that. So often people mistake the waist for the halfway point and then your person just looks peculiar. So if you start with something like that, uh, just knowing where the halfway point is very useful. And then... Another useful thing to do is think about drawing the clothes. So we have here, if you'd like to start uh, with this photo, I'm going to look at this lady here in the stripy shorts and see if we can draw her. Um, I don't know if everybody's got that. Uh, yeah, where can I put it? So I'm going to draw on a very big scale. I would suggest you either use a pencil, probably a pencil is more useful, and then go over it with the rotaring pen and throw some water at it. Um, actually, before we start, I just want to show you some examples of um, mad sketching. Uh, so here, this is a similar thing. I just want to show you the effect of the pen. So you just do a kind of linear drawing and then throw water at it. So you've got a nice kind of deep, uh, you can add tone really easily to a sketch. And then I've got another one here just to show you uh, how scribbly my sketches are. So this is actually more or less the same scene as this. Um, this was the Latitude Festival on a lovely sunny day. And it's just very scribbly, but you can just see delineation. You have to be quite quick because you've always got someone saying, well, have you finished yet? So just be quick and quite scribbly and think of contour drawing. And uh, I had another one here. Uh, so there's a little bit of Amsterdam, but luckily I could sit there for, you know, at least half an hour and do that. And I think what I did was actually add watercolour wash at the end. And then I just saw go by here. Um, <coughs> people in front of um, the museum. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, here we are. So again, so this is uh, people in front of the Vermeer. And you can see how simple. We've just got the shapes. So as long as you know the halfway points, the hip, it, people end up looking okay. And a useful thing to do is actually follow the clothes. So I am go probably going to do this stripy la uh, lady in the stripy shorts. So I'm just going to start here. I'm working very big, uh, just so you can see what I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> uh, but you could work smaller, and then I will become more sketchy as I go on. So here we are, and there she is, about there. And I'm going to be very scribbly. So quite a nice way of doing it is just to do almost a silhouette contour drawing. So I'm keeping my, oops, i give her a neck, that would be a good thing. Just keeping my pen on the paper all the time and looking at where her elbow is. So this is her bottom. It's here, so that's where her hips are. And then you can see what her legs are up to. So again, it's just getting this freedom of building up a uh, line and not worrying. So your sketchbook is only for yourself and people are one of the hardest things in the world to draw. So you don't have to show anybody. So here we are. Uh, so 
that is her halfway point so if you're worried uh, you're drawing people and actually drawing people outside is probably you won't be able to do that but just to have a look at what's actually happening and let yourself let your pencil kind of flow over the paper and don't worry about things so I, I, I also I'm pressing quite hard with my pencil so you can see what's uh, what I'm up to. She's got a bit of a tilt. She's so the weight is here. I don't know if you can see she's in the almost the classic contra contra pose where um, You've got your weight on one leg. So the weight is on this leg here This legs hanging around not doing much and you can see the hip is slightly further down So I'm just kind of exploring what's going on here and as usual my head is too small So I'm just going to add a bit there and uh, so we've got an idea of uh, a person, so that's good. And then what I'm going to use, again, I would, if I was working smaller, I would use my rotary pen, but I'm going to use this pen because it's nice and big and you can see what I'm up to. And then you start looking at the clothes because often you can define people uh, by their clothes. So I'm just going to go over here. She's got this top on and a waist. And then she's got this stripy shorts, which is quite good because they're the same color as my pen. And not worrying too much about the detail, just getting a very quick sketch of a person. Because once you're out, when you're out sketching in the world, what you'll find is people move. <laughs> so you just have to get down a few little notes of how, uh, of uh, the shape and size of people, as it were. Um, you can do uh, almost like, draw them like carrots which I'll show you in a minute. So we've got this lady here doing that, and I'm just going in there, blocking things in. And I suppose the only way to get better at sketching people is to sketch people. So uh, you can sketch from the television, from magazines, get your family to pose, but just see if you can do it in about five minutes so you can get develop almost this shorthand and your own particular style. But just remember, halfway, that is the big thing to remember about drawing people. The hip is the halfway point. So she's here, and you know, who doesn't look hugely like her. But, uh, and then you can start adding detail. In fact, I was just, I'm so tempted to do this stripy shorts. So they're all over here, over here. And then I'm just going to throw a bit of water at it. And this should react similarly to the. Um, <clears throat> the rotary art pen, apart from I've lost the lid of the damn thing. Um, so I'm just going to pick up my medium sized brush. This is the brush I generally take around with me. The little Chinese brush doesn't have to be Chinese, but the, um, the bristles seem to be uh, quite resilient in the pencil case. So I can actually just add tones where the shadows are and quite easily work her up into a reasonable facsimile of a person. And one nice thing to do actually sometimes is um, to actually take the wash away from her, as it were. So if I t take, put the wash that not on her, but on the side, you can see you can often define things, define light within your sketch by doing that. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to do another one. So you get your sketching muscles going. So I'm going to do the this girl uh, striding away. Is she looking at her phone, probably? And again, I am going to start with pencil, just so uh, uh, when things go horribly wrong, I can rub it out. But when you're sketching, you generally can't. You won't have the time to rub things out. So again, I'm looking at this girl here. Can you see that girl there? There we go. And I like her because she's in motion. And one useful way of doing this, so the first one... I, I'm going to look at the halfway point of this young lady. So you can do this. Um, <clears throat> and this is quite useful for when you're doing life drawing. And then I want to uh, actually do a contour drawing, and almost like a silhouette. Uh, so I'm just going to go down this line here, and I'm just going to do a silhouette. So you're not bogged down in detail. And then you start uh, actually developing your own shorthand. Unfortunately, she has got this huge, horrible backpack on. Um, and then we're coming down here, so we'll call that her bottom, and then we're coming down here. So this is what you call a contour drawing, where you're just thinking about the outside of something. And you can get, again, you can, can kind of develop your own shorthand for doing that. Whoops, 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 whoops. 
and then it's quite useful here to look at the negative shape she is creating and we're coming up here whoops and then this leg comes down here and you can see I'm being quite scribbly and well not scribbly but not worrying about using a rubber or outside lines and we're coming down here Ugh. looking at her feet and then her knee and I think I might take that up here just so we know what's going on and, and then we got an elbow so these are two different ways of drawing contour and gesture drawing the first one I did was something called gesture drawing which I think I persecuted you all about uh, which is a, a system that's very popular in America it comes from a book called The Natural Way to Draw by this chap called Nicolades uh, who wrote this book in the 30s and this book is still in print you can see how um, popular it is uh, because I think he hit on quite a good system and then we got this hat oh I hate doing hats can you see so you're getting just you can just do a silhouette type drawing and you've still got a person and then I can start adding details of this backpack and whatever it's doing and oh, look and she's got a bra on and boots so it depends how uh, um, how long they stay there <laughs> how much detail you can add but if you can just do a silhouette of, of someone that's a good start um, and again uh, I can add oh, if I could find the top to my pen I can add uh, detail with a pen but this is just really to get you used to the idea of drawing I'm using this this is actually um, these watercolor pens Winsor new watercolor felt tips they're quite good they had have got this brush thing which I quite like which has this thin and thickness thing and I'm using this because I'm working on quite a big scale I wouldn't uh, use this if I was working on a much smaller scale so here we are here's her hip oh, and then we got a leg so what you could do if you did uh, pluck up courage and go out and start sketching people is that you can do the pencil one first and then you can come home and add pen and I'm just looking at her knees not in the right place so I'm just going to raise that up a bit and look at her boots uh, which are here so you can start looking at more detail but with sketching you're kind of stuck with the, that particular moment you can't um, go back and refer to a photograph so this would work quite well as a sketch just being quite simple catching in the basics getting this negative shape between her legs uh, is very useful and then we've got a backpack and over here so pretty much that oh look she's not looking at her phone she's looking at an apple I'm encouraged <laughs> and then again you can throw water at it uh, which I always like to do I've got to figure out where I did with my brush so again I could just throw water at this and this is uh, quite useful uh, just to do if you do it in your pen so pretty much like that so there we are a sketch um, <clears throat> now I think I'm just looking at this photo and I think uh, I'm not going to do them because even though they are back views I'm going to transfer to the one of the nice lady in the polka dot dress I think that's the one we're going to do next this one this is talking about groups of people so I'm just going to do this group here and again what you do you kind of relate one to another and then we'll also go into perspective of crowds I think so I've got this uh, this little group here of uh, three four people so her him her and possibly her uh, <clears throat> and we're just going to sketch those and again I'm going to start with a pencil um, so they're a little gang together so they're sort of like this just looking at their general shape I will call it a rectangle um, and I wouldn't, if I was sketching, I probably wouldn't draw the rectangle in, but I'm just, I want you to have a look and look at negative shapes that they may create. So here we have the nice lady in the polka dot dress. So again, I'm being quite scribbly with my pencil. Um, there she's got an arm, thinking about where her hips are and where her legs are. Um, so I'm, I'm doing this initially uh, just so I can place the figures and um, <clears throat> if I was sketching I would go directly into the pen but I have been doing it for I think nearly 40 years now I'm just looking at this young man and again can you see he's uh, standing contraposter so he's got this leg is taking the weight 
this leg is kind of a little bit slack and not doing anything. So that gives him a slight tilt to the hips. And you start looking at um, how people use their bodies, really. And this was gay pride, so I <laughs> perhaps I will um, not think about how they use their bodies. Right, okay. Uh, so we're just getting the block in. So you relate one to the other. So we got a shape in between the lady with the red hair and, oh, there's a blonde in there. Uh, she's creating a shape with that and then he's creating this. So I'm going to go in with a pen. I just want to kind of plot this out so you can see what's going on. Another useful thing to do, <coughs> uh, which is why I put the rectangle in, not that it's easy to do when you're outside. If you can actually sort of almost put an imaginary rectangle around anything or imaginary uh, straight line. So you can actually relate her and you create a negative shape just here. So you're relating her to him to her. And we're looking at the, uh, the negative shapes as well. But don't worry about that. Let's just get sketching. <coughs> So, no, I'll stick with my, my big felt tip because I am working on this big scale. <clears throat> so we've got her, and we're looking at her hair. You don't want to go in too much detail. I'm going to try and keep this almost like a contour drawing. So just doing pretty much the outside edge. I might give her an arm, though. Why not? And I know it's a big ask to ask you to sketch people because they are the hardest thing to do, and it's always... Everybody knows when you got it wrong, but you don't have to show anybody. Uh, <clears throat> is uh, one way of improving your drawing of uh, people is to do life drawing, which is, I know, a bit hard at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> um, or just practice drawing people. That's why um, life drawing is still uh, highly valued as just artistic practice, really. Is she touching his shoulder? No, maybe. Uh, so I'm relating her hand to his shoulder. And I'm coming up here. Oh, look, he's got an ear. Putting ears on is always very good. So she's got a head and some sunglasses. And you'll find that you will develop your own particular style and your own particular shorthand. But it's always nice to be able to draw people if you're going to do sketching, uh, because you can add life to your landscapes that way. So we've got a neck here. And again, just looking at his shoulders. Don't worry if things go wrong. <clears throat> I've got the crown. Uh, you can see the crown of his head, which is quite useful. It's almost describing the shape of uh, the roundness of his head. And then we have uh, the dreaded backpack. But I will continue down here and uh, look at where his elbow is in relation to her elbow. So it's about here. And we're coming down here to do the hand. Uh, down here. Look. And here, and then the contraposta hips. So there's her hips, these are his, his hips, and he is a little bit closer, so his feet should be here. Uh, so again, so we're going down here, and looking at the back of the knees, always useful. And coming, oops, no, I think they're further down. <coughs> coming down here, shoes, so looking almost like at his silhouette. And again here, knees looking at the negative shape between his legs coming down here and I suppose I ought to do her legs so you don't have to be fiendishly accurate to and also realistic even to draw people you can actually be quite simple but it will add sort of life to your landscapes uh, so let's look at her knees what are her knees doing <coughs> relating the bottom of her dress to his trousers and then she's got a knee 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 shoo 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 and another knee, and then always looking at that. So I'm going to keep this quite simple. And then she's got her shoes here. Oops, I think I made her legs a bit skinnier than they are, but never mind. <coughs> she's got a waist. She's got this nice polka dot dress. And she's actually looking this way, but never mind. But we just want to get the general idea. And then, so we got him here with an elbow. And then I can put his backpack on. And often a good way into learning how to draw people is to look at their clothes. So you don't think, oh my god, it's a person. It's just a pair of jeans that happen to have a person inside it. And then we've got this lady here. I'm just looking at where she is in relation to his ear. She's a bit higher than that. And again, I'm more or less looking at almost a, a silhouette. And again, a terrible backpack. Oh, well, never mind. Let's do the backpack. And then we've got her 
dress, I'm just looking at the relation to that, it's about here. So looking at that and seeing where her dress is. Um, anyway, and I really can't see much of her at all. Like we can see an elbow, and that is about it. Yeah, and then we got a leg here. So she is here. Oops, and then she's got another leg here with a knee. So I'm just looking there, looking and looking and looking. Oh, she's her foot is going this way, and the other foot is going that way. So you can see um, you don't have to be very accurate, but just relating one person to another. If you've got a sort of little gang of people, it's quite useful to do that. Uh, so looking at the shapes here, oh, I've got this blonde lady here who I can't really see, so I might I could put her head in. And her sunglasses. Call that a sunglass. And you can just do quick linear sketches. And again, I'm trying to get you to work quite quickly. So when you're outside in the world, you can actually just make almost a visual shorthand of how to draw people. And again, I'm just going to throw water at it because I like doing that. And I wonder if actually I can add a bit more uh, shading here, just to get see what this pen does. Ah, uh, there we go, there we go, oops, I'm making her dark, so you see, you see you can add tone really easily. Is everybody keeping up? Everybody keeping up? Yeah, yeah, good, good. All right, next! <laughs> Uh, so we're going to work on this photo and I just want to show you the perspective of crowds. Um, um, I saw quite a good video, which I think I'm going to rip off, about how to draw crowds. Um, so generally, uh, you are at eye level with the crowd because you are a person, you're standing up, they're standing up, so everybody's at the same eye level. If you're very high up, obviously people are going to be foreshortened from the top or the bottom, and if you're lying down, people are going to look bigger, as it were. Uh, but we're going to look at the eye level of crowds. So I'm going to use the same photo here. So if we call, can you see that? I think I will pin myself, give me a sec, so I can see what I'm up to, pin, pin, pin. Hey, there we go. So I just want to look at the eye level of crowds, because often people want to kind of populate their paintings with people, and this is a very useful way of um, sort of understanding how uh, people and crowds work. So I'm going to say this is my eye level, so we say that eye level, eye level, which is actually the, also the horizon line. So if I was out at sea, it'll be the same thing. So that's uh, the eye level, and then so we've got uh, here, well, no, actually, I'm going to move her over here. So she's here, um, and again, I'm just being really scribbly. You can do this; doesn't matter. She's got a dress on, and then her legs are here, and then we've got him again. And you can't see his eyes, uh, but you can see his jeans, and again, him. So these are people quite close to us, and then her; she is shorter and probably shorter than me as well, so and that's why she's a little bit further down. But then if you look at the people behind here, more or less, all their eyes are on the same level. I think she is very tall. Uh, <clears throat> so if I go over here, uh, so we got him, and again, oh dear, not much of him, but I'm just looking at where his feet are. Is that him? No, that's her. His feet are just about here. And then looking at the lady in the green, who's a little bit shorter. But again, you can see, so this is how you get perspective in crowds. You get, uh, it's uh, looking at the feet. So everybody's eyes are on the same level, generally. But it's the feet that vary. And so if you get someone even further away, so I could have someone even further away, and they're down here. Oops. Let's block them in. Can you see? So it's always the eye level is the important thing. And uh, I can't really see anybody else, but, um, and then I could have a little tiny person over here. So you're getting the idea of space and uh, look at where their feet come. So if you can actually have most people's eyes on the same level, um, then you put the sort of crowd in perspective. Can you see it all right? Yes. 
<clears throat> so, next. Um, so I'm going to do nature next. Uh, so I've got the garden. And I'm actually going to do this on watercolour paper. Um, and then we're going to try and think about putting people in things. Look. Ooh, watercolour paper. Nope. Let's have it that way round. I didn't realise, because I'm making you sketch really quickly, obviously, it's going to take a little time. But I want you to be able to... Uh, maybe look at some holiday snaps or something to be able to do it yourself, to work from photographs and just give yourself that time limit. You're not going to do it really, really quickly. You're going to be able to um, uh, do it in five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, if that. So just to do, be able to do uh, the drawing really quickly and just get down a sort of notation of what the people are up to. So here we have the garden. Uh, this is actually Board Hill, but there's all sorts of nice uh, different kinds of uh, textures and plants and different things. And I'm going to paint this up. So I do want a clean piece of watercolour paper. Let's go here. Mm. Let's get this one. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this has got a tiny bit of perspective in it, which is useful. So that can... Uh, reinforce the learning from last week. A little bit of perspective. What is it? Is that right? Everybody can see. I think I'm going to have to have it there. So I'm doing this garden picture. So I've got my kit. I don't think I'm going to use the crayons at the moment. But uh, if I was there sketching, I would go directly in with the pen. But I would perhaps recommend you perhaps have a stab with pencil first. So I'm just looking here. So we'll call that where the arch is and it's it's a very nice pleasing picture because they there's perspective and lovely flowers but we've almost got this sort of um, window on another room of the garden as it were uh, so here we are and then I'm just going to use sighting remember sighting so I'm just going to use that to go here and then we're going to look at the other one and that to go there so that's my sighting so that's putting a little bit of perspective. Well, actually, I'll go darker so you can see what I'm doing. I'm putting a little bit of perspective in the in this um, painting I'm doing and just using sighting. So what will happen if there was more lavender, this would probably go like that. So again, so whoops, it's gone a bit wobbly. And then this is like this. And you can see the angles increase. I'm just doing that so you can understand uh, the perspective of the situation. And then this is all pretty much flat plane. Hooray! So we like that. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to look at the arch. Uh, I'm looking at almost the negative shape of the arch. So I'm just going in with pencil. Ah! So it's about like that. And here we have a box hedge. Again, flat plane elevation. And another box hedge. <coughs> What's that doing? It's being a box hedge. And then we've got the lavender here and lavender there. And then we've got this lovely rose arch. It's a very little tiny rose. So I'm just putting the basics in with pencil and then I will be adding uh, more detail with pen. And then we've got a box hedge here. This we call that lavender. I wouldn't recommend uh, go quite so hard with the pencil, but um, I'm just doing it harder so you can see what I'm up to. And then we've got some lovely roses here. So I'm just going to have a little squiggle around and add me roses. Roses, roses, roses. And over here, roses, roses, roses. And what's that? Oh, some sort of fern. And then we've got this nice thing uh, here. And we've got some trees over there. And we've got a shadow sort of there. And then we've got uh, this nice urn, or whatever it is, big old plant plot. So I'm just going around with that. And often with landscapes and um, other things, and nature and uh, other things like that, no one knows what it really looks like. So you don't have to sweat the small stuff. As long as you get the idea, get what you liked about why you sat down to sketch that thing in the first place. 
So here we are. Um, what I'm going to do is just rub out some of my pencil marks because these are going to be very intrusive into the watermark, watercolour. So excuse me for a sec, I'm just going over here so I don't wobble the camera around endlessly. Okay, so there's kind of a ghost image left there, and I'm going to start uh, using, I'm going to use my rotary pen, because I can't resist. Uh, no, yes, no, yes, no, 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 I should use, because I want to keep the colours here. And um, so I'm going to use the waterproof pen, sorry, I'm <laughs> confusing you, I'm confusing myself. Uh, so I've got one here, I think I might get a bigger one actually. Uh, if I could find one, uh, it's not one to hand, um, because I'm working on quite a large scale. This is A3-ish, you're probably working on A4, I would recommend you work on A4. So I'm just going to start looking at this detail here. So I've got my little box hedge, uh, which is kind of squiggly, but it is, uh, so can you see, so I'm making these little squiggly marks to indicate box hedge, but here I have lavender, which is spiky, so I'm going to try and indicate the spikiness of lavender, but it is quite a, well, not a bouffant shape, but it is kind of a round shape. So I'm just going to indicate some lavender with these nice spiky marks. Oops, and then we got here. Ooh. So that wants to be a little puffier, but there is a certain up and downness to lavender. I don't know how else to describe it, really. So here and here and here. And then I've got some shadow here. I'm just going to put it in here for my own information where the shadow is. And look, my urn's in the wrong place and it's too big. So I will go back and correct that. So that's the shadow. Got me box hedge. I've got another box hedge here, which is, I suppose, almost a geometric shape, but it does have kind of soft edges. So I'm just going to squiggle around, not make it straight, but it has got that certain texture to it. And then it is in light, so the top is slightly lighter. So I'm going to have a little squiggle here to show how it changes in space. So that's light, that's darker. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to have a little squiggle here, indicate some bit of tone. Oh, look, there's a puffy, yellowy, greeny thing there, so I'll put that in. And then we're coming over to the roses. So I'm going to draw, I'm going to imagine there are more roses, but I'm just going to use, almost use like a shorthand, have this kind of almost spirally thing. If people remember the Christian Dior Rose, or even the Macintosh Road. Roses are basically a spiral, and their things come out like that. I mean, they go round and round and round. So they're not just round like uh, peonies or uh, something else like that, or daisy. They, they are, within their structure, there is this spiral. So I'm gonna put a few random roses in there, even though they're not there, but I want them. Um, and I'm just gonna put a few leaves in. And you sort of develop visual shorthand for each kind of different thing you're trying to draw. Da, 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 da. So we're just indicating texture. There's a couple of stalks here. Maybe you should have that one on the stalk. Well, maybe I'll put another rose in. Stalk, stalk, stalk. So, <coughs> and then we've got some tone here. I don't know if you can see in the photograph. Uh, the tone here is defining the lightness of that thing there. So I'm just going to have a bit of a squiggle. I just want to add a little bit of tone for me box hedge. And I want it to be a different kind of shape to me roses. So squiggle, squiggle, squiggle. Uh, maybe I should join that up a bit. <laughs> it's looking a bit odd. It's looking like a mad maths problem. Uh, and here we have the lavender. And we just got a few spikes. If you just put a few indications of what the lavender might be up to. So we got this spikiness and it comes in almost waves, doesn't it? So we got so again I'm putting in a different shape to indicate lavender. Yeah. And then over here, I'm gonna put that shadow in because that is quite important. And then we have this rose arch. So I'm looking relating this bit of box hedge to that bit of arch. I do want to have a bit of stuff going on. And then there's a bit over there. Nah. So again, another box hedge over here. I think, I think, I think. And it's quite dark. 
down there it's casting shadow on its own flower bed and again we've got the lavender here but first things first I want to put the structure of the rose arch in so we're gonna have a bit of a squiggle 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 yeah, and then we've got the lavender which is this this kind of shape and and then a few bits of lavender which should actually get bigger as they come towards you so I'm looking at this sort of shape this sort of shape yeah. and again we have actually do have some roses here so I'm going to pop, pop a few little roses in well quite big roses actually and I'm spiraling around just to indicate them and if you look at the work of illustrators they don't want to reproduce uh, reality they want to add well almost their own personality their own style to it and by sketching that's how you find your own style sketching 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 um, I'm thinking of the work of well I was saying Quinton Blake but that's someone else who does lovely sort of jolly garden illustrations and you often see these in magazines and things but I can't think of it, the name offhand so again just indicating a few little stalks and leaves and actually that's in shadow there and oh look, there's a bigger rose so I'll have a bigger rose there <clears throat> so there we are I've established that I got that bit wrong <clears throat> so I'm just going back there I'm looking at where my shadow is and then we've got this big old rose arch which comes up here Ooh. I think there's something going on there there's some sort of palm tree so again so I've got a little bit of palm tree I can see so I'm again I'm changing my marks again to be quite spiky not being fiendishly accurate I'm not doing a great uh, uh, botanical drawing or anything and then over here I've got something going there but I want to get me urn right so I'm just looking at where it is and I've just made it too big that's the problem and then again that's got some flowers in I think they were geraniums and looking at its shape whoops and again can you see what I'm doing I'm actually uh, making even though well, is it that round no it's not that round but uh, if you can actually make uh, curves into straight lines it's quite much easier to analyze a curve that way so we've got something going on here and here and something going on there and then behind that we have a window strangely enough I think that was a window to a greenhouse but I want to put that in because it's um, you've created a little kind of uh, window here and then there's a window behind there so when you have sort of gaps in hedges or trees kind of frame things it actually makes you think about the view in between so often when you're faced with the um, the overwhelmingness of actual reality that you're out in the world sketching and there's so much information coming into your brain if you can isolate images and uh, through looking at through windows or through uh, as I say gaps in hedges or little archways uh, you have often got an immediate view and it makes it much easier to sketch so we got something going on here oh, and something going on here what uh, all right so we got another kind of fancy thing there and a fancy thing here and then that building is a little bit further away and so I got me spiky palm and then over here we've got all sorts of weird things happening so I don't want to be too crazy and draw every single leaf but I want to get the general shape of these shrubs is that some sort of peony or something I don't know and we got a rose and another rose maybe and some more roses so we've got little these are kind of pink roses and I'm having a big old scribble up here scribble 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 because so I just want to indicate uh, the tone there and hopefully uh, when I come to paint it um, I've got, I'm using a waterproof ink because I wanted to keep the colors bright and then I'm just I just want to indicate a little bit of tone with what's happening here as you can see I'm just squiggling around squiggle 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 um, and building up tone and thinking about these plants as three-dimensional objects and then we have this lovely rose art and there's lots of roses there I don't know what to do about those um, I might 
I was thinking I might put them in later, but no, I will put them in now, just so I know where they are. So I'm randomly putting in these little tiny roses. And then you can see the difference in the foliage there. So this is a little tiny, almost like a fairy rose, a uh, little tiny rose with actually the foliage uh, reflects that. And we've got little roses up here and here and here and here. There's a lot of them. And then we've got this big, I think it's a yew hedge up here, isn't it? And another bit of yew hedge over there. And we're having a bit of a squiggle. So I'm just looking at the big shapes of um, the foliage here. I don't think I want to do too much. And again, having a bit of a squiggle every now and again, just to indicate tone. So again here, so again, we've got this nice foliage over here. Tone, 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 tone. But I probably will use, uh, when I paint it, that will be easier. I think they have these rope swags for their climbing roses. And it kind of falls away that way. And over here, bit of a squiggle. Squiggle, squiggle, squiggle. I just want to build it up been quite free with my line and my mark making. And look, we have another palm tree. So again, spiky, spiky, spiky. And spiky, spiky, spiky. And then some trees over here, which I'm not going to worry about. Okay. Ooh. So, <clears throat> and we've got the lavender ca casting a shadow. Got some shadow over here. I'm just going to indicate it for my own information, really. I'm not... Uh, worrying about um, uh, what it's going to add to the proceedings. I just want to make sure that I know what the shadows are up to. So again, every now and again when you get a big, biggy, bigger, puffier bit of lavender, you will have a bit more shadow. <clears throat> so that is quite a quick sketch. As I say, this is on a larger scale than I normally work with, but I'm going to colour it in now, and a lot of this is just about colouring in. Uh, so I've got my little palette here. Um, this is the nice little Van Goghs. I'm just going to take that out. Can you see? Yeah, palette here. I can get rid of that lot. Palette, palette, palette. And I'm going to primarily use, my, this is my middle size brush, and then uh, these come with these nice little brushes. And what I might do first is actually use my smaller brush and put in some of the colour, particularly the roses, so I know I'm not going to go over the areas where they are. So let's have a red rose. I've got a nice red rose, or oh, pinky rose, whoops, sorry about that. May I have put the water over here? That will solve a lot of problems. Sorry, I'll put it. And have some kitchen towel. So I always take kitchen towel out sketching. And I'm just going to put my imaginary red roses in here. It's almost like, um, that's reminding of Alice in Wonderland <laughs> and the Queen of Hearts. And let's call these red roses too, why not? So as you see, I'm just making quick marks. I'm just indicating the colour. And if you wanted to kind of work this up into a proper painting, you have made colour notes, which is very useful. I've then got a kind of pinky, pinky rose. Let's do that pinky rose. Um, so I've got a kind of nice pinky magenta colour here. And so again, I'm just going to go in here and blob in some pink bits. Let's have some pink bits over there. Not even over there. And maybe over here too. Oh, I forgot to put the roses in there. Never mind. But you can see I'm developing this very, very quick way of painting and hopefully it'll work. So now I'm going to tackle the lavender. So I'm going to use my nice magenta and a Brit or French ultramarine to make a lavender colour, I hope. Yeah, that'll do. So again, I just want to, oops, there's a bit too much water on there. Just go over it, looking at this nice puffy shape of the lavender. And, oops, 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 oops. So uh, again, I can actually just use my brush to make little spiky lavender shapes, I hope. So there's more here. And they come in cut, almost drifts in some places. So it kind of drifts down here, drift, 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 drift. And again, looking at the nice puffiness of that lavender. I might do a little bit of that, a little bit of this. And 
Again, puffy, puffy, puffy. Puff, 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 puff. Okay. <clears throat> and then, so I pretty much I want to really catch this colour. Now a lot of this is now going to be green, unfortunately. So in this little set, I've got this very nice sap green. If you don't have a uh, a sort of nice warm yellowy green. Uh, just mix whatever you've got with uh, yellow ochre or yellow. So actually lavender is kind of a cooler green isn't it? So I'm going to actually just have a little bit of the viridian knocking around with a teeny weeny bit brown I think. Let's have a look. So I want that to be quite a cool green and just going to go boop, 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 boop. And again, I got a little bit too much paint on my brush, but I just want to plop it on. Can you see? So we're getting just quite a nice effect there. I'm not going to worry about going around each individual frond, but I just want to have that indication. And again, here, I just want a little bit of green in between the purple marks I made to indicate this is lavender. Oops, they're mixing up there. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. Okay, so I think I better tackle uh, the grass. So again, I'm going to use, well, not again, uh, for the first time, I'm going to use sap green, which is pretty good. And I might cheat and use a slightly bigger brush because I've got quite a big space to paint. So the, always use the biggest brush you can bear to use and have that a nice puddle of paint mixed up, which is not... Oh, well, there we are. There's some water over there. Right. <laughs> and again, that will probably do. So I'm just going on here. And it kind of stops there, doesn't it? It stops there. And actually, I'm finding that... Uh, I want to put a bit more sunshine in it, so I'm just going to grab some yellow. Some actual yellow. I want a little bit more... Ah, oh, that's better. That's looking more sunshiny. And you can see I'm just putting on quite quickly and just trying to keep this quite fresh. Hum. And then I've got a little bit of shadow to worry about, uh, which I indicated with some pen marks here. So I'm just going to pick up a little bit of the uh, nice viridian and then, oops, uh, I'm going to have some dark brown. Dark brown. I should have wet them first. And I just want to put in a little bit of shadow just to indicate where the sun's coming from. I'm putting it on wet just because I like doing that. Maybe I should have let it dry. There, and a little bit of that over here. Uh, um, and while I've actually got that mixed up, I could think about. Uh, no, I won't. <laughs> I've changed my mind. Oop. I am going to put the lights in. So with watercolour, the general rule of thumb, if you're not familiar with it, is to always um, paint the lightest thing first. So that's why I changed my mind rather rapidly. Oh, hang on. I'm going to fiddle. Just want to have... Nah. No, don't like that. <laughs> Rats. That's why you don't fiddle. Okay, so I'm going to get some yellow going because this is very... That thing is very yellow. You can still see. Very yellow. Uh, so I'm going to get a nice bright yellow wash uh, with a little bit of green in it, I think. Oh, sorry. A little bit of green in it. Um, if I can sway these paints to work. In fact, I'm just going to spray them. Always a useful bit of kit. Just have a bit of spray around. Uh, a lot of people have these weird pipettes, but uh, spray does me. I'm just going to spray them because they're a little bit dry, which is strange because last week they were practically pouring out of their palettes. So I'm mixing up quite a nice uh, yellow, and actually lemon yellow might do it, with a bit of sap green. Whoa! No, I think I'll stick with that yellow. Um, <coughs> you can see. So I've mixed up this nice bright yellow. So I'm going to paint that blob there. That's really very yellow. It's almost acid green, isn't it? And then uh, there's a bit of lighter bits there. So I just want this different kinds of foliage that I can work with. And then I'm just going to add a little bit of sap green to this yellow and actually do the top of the box hedge. 
Oh, that's not yellow enough in my view. So I'm going to add a bit of yellow to that. So we're looking at the tone of the box hedge. So that's quite well lit. So I'm just going to leave that to dry. And then I'm going to come back oops, and add the darker one once it's uh, dry. And again here, we've got this nice uh, foliage here. So again, so this is where the practice of the Chinese brush painting comes in. Not that you've done that, but um, so you can just go in there and just indicate. You can almost color in what you've done, but you don't have to because you've got the marks there that you've done in the pen. So have a few things. Oh, I think I need a bit of variation. So I'm going to have a slightly darker sap green going on here just to indicate some shadows. And I'm pretty much going to leave it at that. So <clears throat> up here we've got this darkness here. Actually just for a change I think I might do my own. I fancy using something other than green for a minute. So I've got this nice uh, burnt sienna colour which is generally pretty good for urns. And I'm just going to go on here and that's a little bit too dark so I'm just taking off a little bit and putting on a drier brush on my urn. And that needs to be lighter. Hmm. That definitely needs to be lighter. So I'm actually just, while it's still wet, I'm going to use some water and just bring off. So I'm using a clean, dry brush on there just to vary the tone. So you can lift off water color with a clean, dry brush. And then, just to bring it all together-ish, is I'm going to start painting this very far away background. So I think I'm going to use a little bit of Payne's Grey, a little bit of Sap Green, and I just want to paint this. So we've got this very bright white window. I think it was a greenhouse, so I assume there's something in there. And again, so that's indicating that darkness. And then, I just notice here in the picture we've got uh, something that's not quite as white so I'm just going to use a little bit of yellow ochre now I think with a tiny bit of paint spray yeah. to have something going on there which I think is too dark so I'm just going to go along there just indicate something's happening and then we've got something going on here and we oh then that's white yeah. That's wrong, but we've got this little wall, so again, just going to have a little bit of the uh, burnt sienna. And again, with watercolour, um, you're, th you're putting on the lighter things on first, and then once it's dry, I will go back and sort of add the shadows. No idea what's going on there, but let's call it white. But then we've got some shadow within this courtyard, so I'm just going to paint the courtyard a little bit. White pale, so I've just got a tiny bit of paint on my brush. No, that's too much. Uh, here and then once that's dry I can paint on the shadow and I want that to be a little bit lighter so I'm just going to dab it with some kitchen towel <coughs> right and then oh I could do a little bit of uh, the geraniums here I think they were geraniums in this pot and I'm going to take some bright red and actually put geraniums in So we're getting quite a nice idea of uh, uh, just being able to be quite free with your foliage. So I'm now we're going to, I'm actually going to use quite a big brush, but if you're on A4, you probably don't need one bigger than that. But I'm going to use my big one because I've got a lot of area to cover. And again, I want to bring the light out. Uh, so I want to perhaps paint the lightest color there. And you'll have to excuse me. I might be a while as I mix up a lot of the sap green and a bit of yellow. Yeah. And some yellow ochre, maybe. Yeah, that'll do. Uh, so I just want to put that in, and I want that to be quite light. You can see, and I'm technically I'm going to go around the roses, but there's so many of them, it's rather difficult. So this is the lightest colour I'm dealing with, and I will go back yeah, and add some darker versions of it to indicate the light. So we've got some roses there. And down here, down here. So 
So I don't want to, I want, this is why I put the pink in, so or just indicated where roses were. I wanted to leave some spaces. And again here, I suppose what you could have used is maybe wax, uh, like we did in our experimental landscapes, just to indicate lots of little white bits. Or, uh, come the time, uh, you could just add uh, some white crayon, I mean some pastel crayon or white gouache, because painting around all these little white roses is going to drive anybody insane. Oops, so I think I might add those later. And then this is all in shadow here, but I do have a nice bit of frond, actually, while I'm here, I might get a little bit of this going. Uh, so again, I want the lightest version of the green first. And I'm just sloshing some water on. I'm trying to leave some of the pink going on. And I've got this nice, bright uh, bit of box hedge here. Ah! Wrong colour. <coughs> da, 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 da. And I just want to go around my little bits of pink. And again, I would treat those roses like the ones I did over there. But you can see, just by doing interesting mark making, you're getting quite a nice, well, almost cartoonish version of this garden, which is much nicer than a sort of slavishly reproduced every leaf and petal kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but now I want to put in, oh, I've got some spiky fronds to deal with. So I'm just going to have some sap green some yellow ochre and I'm going to put in my spiky fronds spiky spiky spike 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 and you see so using the brush to actually imitate the marks of the thing and then hmm a little bit of paints gray I think to just indicate that even though I know these are white they are actually in shadow so I'm just going to uh, <coughs> add some darks here. So in the photograph you've got here. So I've put in my light areas and I am painting like the clappers but if you're out there sketching you would have to paint quite quickly. Um, so here I just want to uh, indicate some darkness and I'm going to cheat a bit just for time. So I've got here some of my tube watercolours and there's this nice colour called per Perilene Green which is really, really dark and already mixed up. So the way I would make this colour would be some probably Viridian green and Payne's grey and then probably a little bit of burnt umber. But as you see, you've got a nice dark colour. I just, I just wanted to crack on. Uh, so I'm just going to... Uh, well, there you go. There's a bit of shadow and that's probably too much. Hang on, just grab some kitchen towel. But, you know, no mistakes, just happy accidents, as Bob Ross says. So I'm just going in here where I indicated with my, my squiggles where the shadows are. So over here, for instance, her. in fact, that probably needs to be a bit more, not quite so cool. But here, this U hedge, can you see? So that would define this lighter bush here, which I'm just going to put here. So it's the dark you put on that defies the light. Uh, and I'm fiddling, don't fiddle. We've got some, actually that's very dark. Ooh, I'm just going, that's not working. I'm fiddling! <laughs> Don't fiddle. And then over here, I probably want something a little bit darker here. So I've got a little bit of sap green knocking around there. And a little bit of this green gold, which I like very much. So I want to indicate what the U hedge is up to. So it's kind of going around the corner. It's kind of a geometric shape. And again, that is defining the light of that little thing there, whatever it is. And I'm just going to soften this edge just with a little bit of water. And over here too. Blob, 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 blob. And then I'm going in with my perylene green because that will define this area here, this sort of shadow in the arch. And over here, and over here, and over there. A couple of roses or peonies or something. And actually, that is quite dark, just there. Uh, so again, I'm just going to pick up a little bit of sap green. I want that to be a little bit softer, so I'm going to layer that on top of this very dark green that I mixed up. And, and then I better do some more <laughs> over here. So again here. So you can see that the foliage comes in puffs and swathes. So we've got kind of sway the roses over there. So I'd probably want to indicate that. Uh, <laughs> over here and over there. And again, it's the dark defining the light. 
over here. I think I want a bit more of that green gold. Splooshing over here. Sploosh, 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 sploosh. Ooh, I might do something crazy. Let's sit, let's have a look. Yeah. <coughs> and again, not overthinking things, and that is the joy of sketching. If you're sitting down for two hours just drawing, painting the same painting, you kind of overthink and you can get a bit tight and fiddly. But if you just sketch, you develop your own visual shorthand, you discover new ways of doing things. So I'm just spraying that. Ooh, like that. Mm, well, maybe not quite so much. But just to soften that. So I'm getting nice squiggly patterns there. And then I want to put in my shadows. Uh, so I'm going to mix up a sort of shadow colour. My favourite combination thereof is generally Payne's Grey. And see what happens. I do like the Payne's Grey. So I've got some shadow here, so this urn is casting shadow. Oops, I'm just going to dry that off a bit because I'm pretty sure that was too much on there. So we've got an urn. And then we've got shadows here being cast by something. And shadow on the wall. And then shadow here, which is much darker. So a bit more Payne's Grey. Yeah, maybe a tiny bit of green. Let's have a little bit of green in there, go on. Um, so I'm putting the shadow in and looking at the shape the shadows make. Ooh. Hmm. Ah, uh, maybe I'll have a little twiddle around. Twiddle, twiddle, twiddle. I suppose that's why I like this Chinese brush, actually, because you can make interesting marks with it, and it kind of twiddles around up there. So I hope you can see that you don't have to be madly accurate, you can just enjoy it and you can see you can make different marks and as I say this is with a waterproof pen so I, I wanted to keep the colours bright but if you use a water soluble pen you want to be able to um, not mind when they dull up your watercolours.